Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the first edition of Writer's Block. I'm J.O. I'm a board member of the Korean American Story, whose mission is to capture, create, preserve, and share the stories of Korean American experience. Uh, Writer, Writer's Block is our new quarterly free virtual community event where you can personally engage with Korean American authors live. And this program is made possible by our Storyteller Circle donors. So we'd like to thank them for their generosity. And later you'll find out how you can support Korean American Story and programs like this. But now I am thrilled to welcome our very first guest for Writer's Block, Francis Cha, the author of the best-selling, critically acclaimed novel, If Wait. I Had Your Face. So Francis, welcome to the Writer's Block. Thank you. Hi. So since we are Korean American story, um, we're going to start with your Korean American story a little bit. Um, and, you know, that question, where are you from, can be quite fraught for a lot of um, Asian Americans. But um, tell us, where did you grow up? I know it's very slightly complicated story for you as well. Um, so I was born actually in St. Paul, Minnesota when my father was getting his PhD here. And I was born, um, the town is called Dinky Town. And, you know, nobody believes me when I say it's really true. <laughs> it's called Dinky Town. It's oh, I know. And I know there's somebody who's here um, from me. Uh, yes, we know Dinky Town. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, it's my favorite town name. And uh, when I was four, we moved to Texas where um, my father got a job teaching at the, one of the UTs. And so when I was eight, we moved to Hong Kong, new job for, for dad. And I attended a British school in Hong Kong for four years. And then um, when I was, right before I turned 12, I moved to Korea. And that was when I started going to public Korean school. Um, and that was Yu Kang Yan. Uh, sixth, sixth grade in Korea. Um, and that was a, a big culture shock for me. Yeah. And then I attended boarding school in the States for high school, but I was going back and forth um, for every break. So Korea was home for me um, all that time throughout college. Uh, and after college, I went straight to grad school for a year and then I went back home. Uh, I took a leave of absence and started working in Korea. And then after a few years, I went back to New York to finish my MFA. Right afterwards, I came back. So I've, I've just been going back and forth uh, between, mostly between Korea and the States uh, almost every single year mm -hmm. since I was, I would say, um, 16. So were you always speaking English and Korean as long as you can remember? Or do you do you remember when you were a child, what felt more like comfortable language for you? My parents spoke only Korean to us at home. And it was very important to them that we speak it to them. But I have to say, I think when I was in Hong Kong, I did not identify with being Korean at all. And when that was during the um, the really terrible accidents in Korea, when Sampung Baekkojam mm -hmm. department store collapsed, the bridge 93. Collapsed, and there were all these terrible things happening, and my parents were always riveted by the news. And um, apparently, my brother and I would not be interested, and that made them so upset. And that was what really catalyzed the move to Korea. They were like, oh, this is, because for my parents, it was always in the plan to return to Korea. Mm. And they never applied for citizenship. Um, they were always like, oh, this is temporary. Korea, Korea's home. Mm. And, and they ended up going back a bit earlier than planned because um, of our reaction. And instead of putting us in international school, they immediately put us in public Korean school for that, uh, for that reason. And, and then I was reading a lot in English, but I was still, you know, 
functioning completely in Korean mm -hmm. from that point onwards for several years. But I think when I'm in the States, I speak English and when I'm in Korea, I speak Korean. So it's really a um, brain turning on and off for me. And speaking of reading, since you became a writer, were you mainly reading Korean books or, um, and I'm not just asking you about in terms of the language, but what were you reading? Were you reading Korean novels, Korean stories, or were you more into like American, European novels? Oh, I, I read all over, all over the board. Um, what I don't read actually are Korean novels translated into English, because I find that difficult because I'm constantly translating it back. Because I went to British school in Hong Kong, I grew up with a lot of British children's literature um, and European children's literature. The Moomin series uh, by Tove Jensen is my my favorite, one of my favorite series. In Korea, I read a lot of manga chick, so <laughs> manga, manga. Right. Um, that was, there was a big, uh, Mana Chekbang, it's like a comic book cafe. There was one on every block when, when I was growing up. And I I kid you not, I think I read every series in the girls section because there's a very, you know. Right, I was gonna ask whether if you read yeah. the girls ones or <laughs> the boy ones. Or the boy ones, I was always reading only the girls ones. Um, and that, yeah thousands and thousands of those. So um, one of the biggest fights I had with my mom was when I discovered that she had thrown them all away. Oh, no. I, I'm still so upset. I still get so upset with her <laughs> about that. So I'm I'm constantly uh, combing the Cheonggyecheon Mana Chikbang. There's mm -hmm. a, a block of old um, stores that sell series. And I'm always on the lookout for my favorite series, Princess, by the way. I really want to pitch some of them um, if it's, you know, in the realm of possibility mm -hmm. as like an HBO show or something. Like Game of Thrones has nothing on the <laughs> epic true. scope of these mana. It's like generations and kingdoms and all these incredible I know, I know this is a little off the tangent, but since you mentioned it, it is really amazing to see how sort of the Koreans and Japanese, a lot, because a lot of the manhas were written by Koreans or Japanese, and that's what we read. And it's really interesting to see how the Koreans and Japanese, the Asians, imagine the European society and, you know, or whatever it is, whatever they thought as a, a Western world. Um, Cause we are so used to always seeing the Asian world sort of interpreted through the Western gaze. So it's, I always thought that was really fascinating thing too. But so then did you always notice sort of the difference between the two sort of the Korean versus, and it seems like you were very much, it wasn't just American, it was very sort of the quote unquote, Western culture, right? You were very much exposed to British culture in Hong Kong, um, obviously American, um, you know, cultural influences is everywhere, um, including in Korea. Did you just absorb everything or were you aware that there were differences? And if you were aware, what struck you as the difference between the two or did you just, you know, yeah, um, I, um, especially when I was living in Korea, I would get all my books in English at, at Kyobo Mungo, which was the, Kyobo and Myeongpung are pretty much the only two bookstores at the time, even still, that um, that sell English books. So it'd be such a destination for me because it would require, you know, setting aside, it, for, we lived in Gyeonggi-do, which was outside of Seoul. So it would require like this trip to go into the city and, and get, like a huge stack of books that was going to last me until the next time if I was, you know, those were my English books. And I, I mean, I really noticed it this time around when I was back in Korea this summer and my mom's house is full of my books because I can't bring them here. There's just too many of them. And every time I go back, I end up reading, you know, a good I reread so many books and this time around I realized how 
crazily outdated a lot of these are in terms of I just can't read them anymore and I just mm -hmm. and this was really the first time because they were beloved to me I loved rereading them and now I'm like oh this is just so ridiculous that you know the few books with protagonists of color were not written by writers of color that you know things like that mm -hmm. have started to really bother me and um, like the British children's books that I grew that I read growing up were had a lot of racism in there that I you know, it you don't realize as a child but it does seep in and and at this point I just cannot even look at them. <laughs> is that sad or does it make you just realize things are changing? Oh, things are very much changing, and I I think it's because I'm as a writer I'm also realizing what the industry, you know, what what that entails and how own voices are are heard and and how difficult it is. Um, and so now it's I, I'm I'm very surprised at my own reaction to my beloved previous collection. So let's talk about writing. I, I think we talked before and you said you always thought you would be a writer. What, what did it mean to you to become a writer? I don't think there was anything else I could have become because reading was everything to me. Like my entire, it's just like breathing. And so the only thing that was close to being a reader was being a writer. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't, I couldn't conceive of a job where you're a reader for a living. I was like, oh, well, the next best thing is a writer. Um, from a craft perspective, it's a reaction to two different types of books. One being like incredibly inspiring, exquisitely written books that just make you feel so differently about life and bring upon you all these realizations that you would otherwise not come by. And then the other half are, I would say, terribly written books where you read them and you're like, ah, oh, this is awful. Even I could write better than that. It's kind of <laughs> when you go to, I don't know, an art gallery and there's this one painting in MoMA where, you know, it's like all blue. You're like, ah, oh, you know, I could do that if I just put <laughs> all blue on cam canvas. Um, so it's, for me, writing is always a pull between those two um, separate paths. I'm like, oh, I'm inspired and inspired in those two different ways. So let's talk about your first book, If I Had Your Face. And I am assuming that many people in this room have already read your novel, um, your debut novel, um, which is about four young women in Seoul. So I'm just going to do a quick recap of the characters. Um, there's Ara, who is a mute hairdresser from Cheongju who moved to Seoul with her best friend, Sujin. And Sujin idolizes Kiri, um, who works in a room salon. And Kiri's roommate is Miho, who is an artist. She's also a friend of Sujin from the orphanage they grew up with um, together. Um, and Miho is um, dating for lack of better words, the rich boy. Um, and then there's Wana, um, the one who is married and sort of work in a kind of an office environment and who is kind of away from all of them at the beginning. They all live in this same, what is called office tail building in Korea, ironically named Color House, even though it's a gray building. And the book is filled with stories of room salon and plastic surgery and intergenerational traumas and art and money and men behaving badly. And, but really at the core is this beautiful friendship among the five women that I just listed. Um, so many people when they are talking about your book and your book has been discussed by many writers and um, journalists, when they are talking about you, your book, they suggest that you are offering a quote unquote commentary about the contemporary Korean society. Um, 
I think you were just trying to tell a you know really interesting story filled with interesting characters. But if you were thinking about that aspect, um, what did you want to tell your readers about Korea? Like, what part of the Korea did you want your readers to sort of discover? I think. Um, it's a difficult question, but I would get frustrated. It was kind of born out of a frustration that I had. Um, I went to college in New Hampshire and I would routinely encounter very well-meaning um, people whose only context of, like local people, not, not the students, but they, or actually the students too, where a lot of um, the only understanding they would have of Korea was, for example, what their grandfather had told them about the war. Like the snippets that they knew of Korea would, were not in any way the Korea that I knew and lived in. And so, you know, it's it was the most rapidly changing country in the world. And I think, especially after working at CNN um, as an editor, I kind of really embraced how unique the contemporary society is and specifically. And I really wanted to set a story there and how the concerns are really unique and the desires are, are also very specific to this culture, which has rapidly risen out of the ashes of war and has evolved in such a way that it's unrecognizable even to a lot of Korean American, you know, older generations in, in, in the States. And um, I really wanted to get into that. A lot, a lot of the times I was also struck by somewhat of a frustration of the stereotypes mm -hmm. and kind of a shallow judgment of stereotypes. But I do fear that um, sometimes it, it's, it's backfired because just reading a description of the book and I feel like it kind of perpetuates the stereotype. <laughs> um, the plastic surgery. Everybody mentions like your book is about the plastic surgery and the room salon and that culture. but when you actually read the book, you sort of offer such a detailed perspective on so many different types of people, whether they are room salon workers or orphans, or even, you know, that's sort of the Chebel family, you know, the sort of the rich family. Um, what was your process like um, in terms of research? Um, you lived in Korea as an adult for a while, and then you said you, worked as a journalist, so I'm sure you had many chances to meet with many different people, but especially with somebody like, for example, working at a room salon, what was that process like for you to find out really, to hear from them and try to make that, in, incorporate that into your story? Uh, with room salons, I was really shocked by how little I knew about them when I first encountered them. And you're not supposed to, you're a woman. <laughs> like You're not supposed to know right. that much about them, right? But it, the divide, and what shocked me was how much, once I discovered what they were, um, how prevalent they were in the discussions and the lives of people who do know about it. Mm. And there's just such a wall, um, but it, it is, or it was, um, it, and Seoul is such a rapidly evolving society that I would say things have changed very much even since I started writing the book. But it, to capture that moment in time um, is such a large, actually a large part of the Gangnam, kind of the underground scene, um, business and male camaraderie and all of that. And I encountered it personally uh, in my in my life long before I thought of writing about it and I'd been called there uh, called to one by a friend of mine and and no one 
realized until it was too late and I was already sitting down that I wasn't, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and um, it was just very fascinating to observe and I wouldn't leave. And I, from that point on, I started begging my guy friends to take me along and I would harass them about with questions about their interactions, like how the business works, how the money works, how, you know, affairs work. If, um, if you know, they know people having affairs. Um, and, and then the journalistic research that I did, it was very heartbreaking to read um, and, and interview and kind of delve into that. The, um, the terrible nature of that business. And it's more, it's mo all the more terrible because I think there's such a prevalent perception that these women often do it for the easy money mm. and it's a choice. And actually the more that I researched, the more that I discovered this was not the case. Um, and whether it's an, a debt, a very vicious debt cycle that you're embroiled in through a system of pimps and you know debt collectors, or, but also psychologically, it's very hard to break the cycle, and there's nowhere for you to go. Um, so, yeah, it, that was a big part of the research. The plastic surgery part was also research that I did specifically for the book. And um, just yesterday, actually, a person from my former life in Korea. Uh, emailed me to say that she was an aesthetic physician in Korea and she and it was so accurate <laughs> um, the book was so accurate which you know is very gratifying as a writer who puts in a lot of research and you're kind of terrified that you know you might have gotten a detail wrong or something um, and I, I think that comes from I, I don't know where it comes from I think it's because um, as women, especially, we're we perfectionists and, and have this imposter syndrome a lot of the time. But yeah, it was yeah. gratifying to get her email. To tell you that what she saw in her yearbook was pretty accurate. And I'm sure um, our viewers are going to have a lot of questions to you about the book. But um, we're going to take a quick break and uh, we're going to do something really fun. It's called quick fire questions. You have no idea what's coming at you. So <laughs> I'm just going to throw out these questions at you. And without thinking about it, you give me the answers. OK, and um, we're Korean. So we're going to talk some about some food. Um, so what's your favorite kimchi? Oh, yolmo kimchi. Yeah, <laughs> good choice. How do you make your ramen? Uh, with a little too much water. Oh, you like it watery? <laughs> uh, it's too cha. Mm -hmm. Your least favorite Korean food? Kichi chicken. Mm. It's the, the, the bean, not bean curds, but what do you call it? Sort of the, the residue of the bean curds thing. <laughs> the ground. Right. Um, Three authors you'd like to have dinner with, dead or alive? I'm just going to go back to my childhood, but Ellen Montgomery, Agatha Christie, mm -hmm. and let's see, Enid Blyton. Oh, okay. Favorite form of exercise? Mm. Do you have one? <laughs> Least favorite form of exercise? Uh, every form of exercise. <laughs> the book on your bedside table right now. Oh, I have Patricia Highsmith. Um, oh, really? Yeah, talented Mr. Ripley. Oh, wow. At night <laughs> before you go to bed? It's not a good idea. <laughs> no. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? To be invisible so I can overhear everyone's conversations. It's a very writer's um, answer today. Um, and in your next life, if you'd like to come back, you, you'd like to come back as what? I would like to come back as a blue whale, but probably 500 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so not the next life. Yeah, great. 
So I wanted to ask you about one thing since it was your first book and you decide to write about Korea. I was wondering, but you're also writing in English. Um, had it ever occurred to you that, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I shouldn't set my first, very first novel in Korea. Have you ever wondered about what that would mean, how you would be categorized into certain um, genre? Um, or did it just come very naturally to you? I did oscillate between thinking that I would never get published because this has not been done often. Um, not until very recently, you know, you did not have a fiction a novel set in Korea. And then kind of thinking, oh, the only way I can get published is to write about Korea because there are so few books set in Korea. So it kind of went back and forth all the time for me. But at that point, because it was home and because it, uh, um, I was spending for the first time since grad school, the entire year in Korea after I graduated and went back to start working, you know, that's, that was home and that was work. And so I kind of had to, unless I was going to do another New York book, which I feel like publishing just has so much of already. <laughs> So it'd just be so hard to pitch one of those. Do you think, well, so for example, when you went to grad school for MFA and things like that, I mean, you know, you're told, I'm sure, you know, people always say writers, you know, write what you know and all that stuff. Did you ever felt like this pressure to always write about Korean or Asian characters or? It wasn't a situation? pressure, it was more a, a big leap of stepping outside my comfort zone because when I was reading in English, I was only reading about white characters mostly. And so I've never read books with Korean settings and characters and words and food and, you know, all these feelings that you can't translate into English uh, and concepts that don't really exist or sound really stupid when you try to break it down in English. And that's something I still struggle with now. For example, bushi. Yeah, yeah. When you translate it in English, it's not, It's like looking down on someone. Right. And that doesn't sound that bad, I feel like, in English. <laughs> but in Korea, I feel like that's pretty much the genesis of all conflict. Mm -hmm. And it's very dramatic and violent and anguished and extreme um, and kind of trying to convey that to a non-Korean mm. language that's very difficult yeah and root of all the Korean soap operas right that's right um, so I think we're gonna bring Deborah back because I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of questions from our viewers um, if we can go to the um, everybody bring everybody back to the screen and see if they want to raise their hand or if they want to send their own questions. So while they are bringing everybody back, I have one because you know I can ask you five hundred thousand questions about your book. Um, I had a quick question, like, what was the most surprising? reaction to your book. You just mentioned something about maybe you were a little worried about you perpetuating all the stereotypes a little bit, but what was up? I had uh, some people write to me and ask, oh, was this based on this, you know, my aunt or was this based on so-and-so when it was very, you know, I, I made it up, but mm -hmm. the score, the story apparently correlated so exactly that they were wondering if it was based in fact. Hmm. So, so do you, I mean, I like, often, 
I think that happens to novelists a lot. Yeah, yeah. And I guess you could take that as a compliment to just say, um, you know, it's, it just seemed so realistic and they can't believe that you've made it up. But okay. So can we see if anybody's raising hand to ask questions? Otherwise, I'm going to keep asking questions. So I want to give somebody a chance to do it. Oh, how about there was this one question that came in earlier, and I wanted to ask you about this. I, I was, I know you, all the excerpts, they, it, a lot of the year books excerpts says four, because they are the sort of the chapters headings. But I always think of them as five, because I think Susan deserves her own chapter. But um, if there is one character that you sort of identify the most with, who would that be? Oh, that depends on what I'm doing and how I'm feeling that day. The most writerly part of me, today actually earlier, I was not in a very good place um, emotionally. And so I went to watch a long string of K-pop music videos. <laughs> and, that was, and I watched the very specific um, string of videos that I would watch uh, when I was going through a hard time about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that always brings me back to, so, you know, in those kinds of moods, I would identify with Ara. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of Pukjapan um, Shinjong with motherhood. It's very like complicated mm -hmm. uh, being a mom and and trying to balance um, expectation and uh, kind of wishfulness, I guess. And that's Wana. She's very, she wants to be a good mom, but she's a complicated person. Yeah, absolutely. So do we have a question from, is it Crystal? Crystal, if you want to meet. Hi. Yes. Um, I was wondering, hi, Francis and everyone. Thank you for doing this. Uh, very happy to listen in on your thoughts. And uh, I was wondering if you think about or um, are open to uh, your works being on the screen at any point in time, or if you prefer to just keep them as novels, like uh, uh, adaptations for TV or for film. Oh, um it's actually in development right now as a TV series. Um, so that that's kind of taking on its own life. It, the team is actually all Korean American women. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Do you have an idea when they're gonna go into the production or is it still in the writing stage? Um, it's still in the writing stage. The showrunners are, uh, the showrunner is Diana's son, mm -hmm. who is also working on a show right now with Amy Adams um, and Adam McKay on Netflix. But this is her kind of her dream baby because it's a Korean and she as she said on Korean American Story on the K Pod Pod podcast, um, that she has been in so many writers' rooms, but has not worked on like a, a series lead with an Asian, um, and have has not worked in the same writers' room as an East Asian with another East Asian writer, which is insane to me. How about Ray? Did I pronounce that correct? R-E-E? -E? Yes, hi. Hi, Francis. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I really loved reading your book. Um, I have two questions that I'm gonna squeeze into one, um, which was basically when you were writing your book, um, how many major rewrites did you have to do? Um, and like sort of what kind of feedback were you getting as you were rewriting? And um, like, were you, did you know from the get go that you were going to turn this into your TV adaptation and how much of that, uh, like when did that sort of um, come into your consciousness 
as you were rewriting or writing, or maybe you just did this in one go. I don't know. <laughs> but thank you so much, Francis, in advance. Um, thank you so much for reading it. And the first, I would say, five years of writing were all spent on one character that ended up being cut from the entire book. And she was supposed to be my second book, but I don't think that's happening. So she's kind of lost in space. She's stranded somewhere, <laughs> kind of screaming in futility. Uh, so, but I think all that time spent on her was not futile um, because, and I, I read a lot of writers writing about writing, and this is a commonly voiced sentiment where you arrive in different places for different reasons through that, throughout the journey of writing. Um, and through that character, I actually started in Boston with her um, and she had been adopted into the original Loring family. And because of her, I was kind of thinking about her childhood friends at the orphanage. And then we arrived to um, Sujin and the rest of those cohorts. So ma major rewrites, I can't even tell you how many. There are many, 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 many documents titled final, 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 final. <laughs> like probably like, I don't know, a good 40. You also said once mentioned, I think it took you like 10 years to write it, right? Okay. So yeah. Okay. So we're gonna, next we're gonna go to Catherine, Catherine Park. Hi Francis. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, you've, you obviously experienced a professional life as not an author. Um, and I was wondering uh, sort of what gave you, I know you said you couldn't imagine not writing um, in, your, during, in your life, but what particularly motivated you to really start writing fiction and write about um, uh, these characters? Did you have a moment like that? Um, I would say I spent the, the most part of my initial writing life trying to write what I thought people would think was uh, like really cool or whatever, what they wanted to read. And the moment that that changed for me and I was just thinking of a very internal um, satisfaction and not thinking of what others might think of it was a big, a big uh, moment in my writing life. And that was after grad school. I think graduate school really did step it up um, in the sense that, okay, you are spending all this money and all this time and your parents think you're kind of crazy and you really have to do it or die and like prove it or die. Like that was going to an MFA program was that, that commitment uh, that I made um, by diving off because I did receive some scholarships, but it was still extremely expensive. <laughs> and that is a commitment that's really concrete and real. And it would have been such a waste of every, everything if I didn't. So that, that desperation and drive was crucial. You know, for all the writers out there, I know you're working hard at it and it will happen. I'm, it's literally a matter of, when I started in my MFA, um, they always start every year by saying, most of you will not get published. And everyone gasps like, oh my God, how can you say that when we paid so much to be here? And then they go, because most of you will not finish your book. And, and that is true. I think real life is very distracting, um, but if you just finish it, you will get published. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's really true. So I, I hope fighting and, and good luck in your journey. Great. 
Thank you so much, Francis, for your words and your book and everything. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for attending this very first edition of Writer's Block. Um, this, as it was mentioned, this event was sold out in record time. And we wish we could have accommodated, accommodated more people. Um, Korean American Story will broadcast this program for you to watch again. So let other people know about it. And the next edition of Writer's Block is scheduled for April. So make sure you follow Korean American Story on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you follow, or sign up for emails so that you don't miss any of the upcoming events. And we look forward to bringing you more programs like Writer's Block, but we need your help. Um, Korean American Story is a nonprofit organization, which means we are counting on your financial support. And you can join the Storyteller Circle by becoming a monthly donor. Just $10 a month enable, enables us to launch new programs like Writer's Block, $25 a month support the complete production of one K-pop episode. Um, you can text storytellers to 44321 to join the storytellers story teller circle or visit our website, um, koreanamericanstory.org. You will also have the option to make a one-time donation and find out many ways you can get involved. And once again, thanks to everybody. Thank you, Francis. We cannot wait to read more books from you. We wish you all the best. Um, and of course, thanks to the staff members of the Korean American Story for making this event a reality. And happy reading, everyone. And good night. Thank you.